whatever. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do this morning is start to open us with prayer. So could you, would you bow your heads and let's pray together. God, we come to you on, at the beginning of a new week, and it's the last week of the first quarter, too. And uh, we might have a lot of things on our minds. Maybe we're feeling burdened by the work that we have to do. But I pray that you would help us to um, have open hearts and minds in the next 45 minutes to learn a little bit more about this gift that you have given us called the Bible. Um, I pray for each one of these young men and women that are in here that they would have seeds planted in their heart um, of faith this morning um, and, and for me as well. So we just... Uh, Pray, pray for this Bible class time now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys, so um, we are, this is the final sort of week that we're going to be looking at the, um, the, this, the unit that we're, we've been working on, which is, what is the Bible? So we started in, in our first week talking about, like, where did the Bible come from? How did we get it? We talked about the process of authorship, and that's your, the first note sheet that you guys have in your uh, folders. Then last week, we talked about how do you read the Bible? Um, and how do you get information out of the Bible? If you've ever tried to read the Bible, you might have found it a little hard to understand. So how can you read the Bible and get God's message to you? And I hope that you guys found it really helpful to hear from Mr. Ruthven. He is an awesome teacher, and I really, really, I always benefit from hearing him speak myself. This week, we're going to talk about one final topic, which is, okay, so let's say we know where the Bible came from. Let's say we're reading it. But how do you know you can trust it? How do you know that it's true? Um, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit today. We're going to look at some reasons, some evidence uh, that might be good reasons to believe that the Bible is true and trustworthy. So uh, to start out with you guys, we're going to play a little game. So this game is called Fact or Fiction. And what I want you guys to do is just think in your head true or false um, I have 10 or maybe eight statements on here, and um, some of them are true and some of them are false. And I'm just going to have you guys vote with a thumb down or a thumb up uh, if you think it's true or if you think it's false. And then I'll show you what the answer is, or I'll tell you what the answer is. Okay? So here's the first uh, one. Okay, professional baseball umpires are required to wear black underwear. True or false? Think about it for a second and then give me a true or false Whoa, okay, Dario, I just need your vote. Everyone else has theirs. Uh, what do you think? Okay, everyone, in case you're watching online, is doing thumbs down, okay? The answer is true. What? Yes, in Major League Baseball, part of the rules for um, umpires is that they have this special, uh, like, regulation underwear they have to wear that is black. I don't know why that's true, but it's true. All right. Uh, number two, humans have unique fingerprints. But gorillas have unique nose prints. True or false? Okay, okay. A couple falses, a couple trues, mostly trues. What do you think, Owen? Okay, okay, okay. All right, this one is also true. <laughs> um, good, good try, though. Some of these are really hard. Okay, what do you think about this one? The average American eats 46 slices of pizza per year. True or false? Okay. All right. All right. Good. Uh, two people true. Six people false. All right. Um, you can put your thumbs down. This one is also, according to the site that I looked at, true. Now, to me, that seems low. I would have guessed that it was like 100 slices of pizza a year. But that's, according to the site that I looked at, that's true. All right. Number four, smoking is the leading cause of house fires in the United States. True or false? Okay, I see a few trues and some falses. Any guesses? All right, this one is false, you guys. Who said false? You are right. Um, does anyone want to guess what the leading cause of house fires is? Stoves, stove tops, yep. And ovens, yep. Uh, cooking is the leading cause of house fires now. But back in the day when smoking was a lot more common, like in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was the number one cause of house fires. And smoking definitely can cause house fires, but now it's like the third leading cause instead of the first. Okay, anyways, um, number five, the first music record ever 
created was someone singing Mary Had a Little Lamb, true or false? False. false. True. We got two trues and everyone else false. Okay, this one is absolutely true. And the guy singing it was named Thomas Edison. He's the guy who invented the phonograph record and he made the first recording and I guess he didn't have any other better thing to sing. So he sang Mary Had a Little Lamb onto the recording. And that was the first recording ever made. All right, number six, Velcro was invented in Great Britain. I have no idea how you would know whether this is true or false, but make a guess. What do you think? Uh, everyone thinks it's true except one false, so two false is okay. This one is false, but I don't know how you would ever know that. It was invented in Switzerland by this guy who took his dog for a walk and his dog got all those little seeds, those burrs stuck to his fur. And he was like, whoa, these things are sticky. And then he looked at, at it under a microscope and he saw the burrs had these like little hooks on them to hook onto fur or people's clothes, you know, when you're walking. And he was like, I'm gonna make something like that. And he did, and he invented Velcro. Okay, anyways, Velcro is that stuff on your shoes and your backpacks that's sticky. Okay, number seven, the most popular pet name in the US is Smokey. True or false? Okay, we're split down the middle. Some true, some falses. Okay, this one is false. Yeah, Smokey is pretty common, but it's like the sixth most common. Does anyone want to guess what the most common is? Duke. It's Max. Duke was up there too. It was in the top 10, but Max is the number one most common pet name in the United States. Okay. Um, last one, you guys. It takes 11 feet of wire to make a slinky. You guys know what a slinky is? They're those toys that are like a coil of wire and it like goes down a stair by itself. Set 11 feet of wire. Okay, almost all true except one false. This one is false too. It takes 35 feet of wire, which is crazy to me. That's like a long ways, um, but it takes a lot of wire to make one slinky, 35 feet. So, okay, now you guys, this is just a like sort of a for fun game. But the, the point of this is every day we have true facts and false statements coming at us all the time, especially with the internet, right? So how do we know that the facts that are coming to us in the Bible are true. How can we tell? What are some tests that we can give to say, hey, there's, yeah, there's evidence that we can trust the Bible. What'd you say? What'd you say, Matthew? Because it's going on today. Maybe, yeah. Um, so what we're gonna do first, you guys, is we're gonna hear from a Bible scholar named Tim Keller. And he is gonna give us some reasons why he believes the Bible. And it's a, like a three minute video clip. Um, and so listen to his reasons. And then I want you guys to, on your note sheet, do you guys see it's like the very first thing? It's just like um, uh, Tim Keller video. What does Tim Keller say is the number one reason he trusts the Old Testament? So we have two parts of the Bible, right? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Tim Keller actually wrote a whole book. He's a, he's a, um, a scholar. He studies uh, the Bible really carefully. And he wrote a book about why he believes in the New Testament. And he put out all this evidence. And then so this guy who's interviewing him is like, okay, you believe the New Testament. That's great. But what about the Old Testament? How do you know the Old Testament is true? So Tim Keller is going to give his, uh, his, uh, his reason why he trusts the Old Testament in addition to the New Testament. So I want you guys to listen and listen for that reason. And then jot down anything that stands out that you notice or observe on your note sheet in that top little place up there, okay? So, here we go. You mentioned the Bible, and in the book itself, you take a great deal of time to argue for its trustworthiness. And you build your evidence around the evidence of the New Testament, and principally the life of Christ. And you point the reader at witnesses, at the fact that these documents were written very soon after Christ, that they were not mythical legends. And you, you spend a great deal in the book on in that whole area. But I want to ask you, what about the rest of the Bible? Because here's a problem that many people have. You argue in the book, well, look at the witnesses. Well, look at how recently the New Testament letters and Gospels were written. But if I had a witness in court and that witness told one lie, that witness's testimony throughout those proceedings would be diminished irreparably by the one lie. So what am I supposed to make of Old Testament 
texts about murder, about dealing with concubines, about this bizarre book of the Revelation where there's horses and scrolls and images. What about all of that? What about those parts of the Bible? The Gospels are the most accessible thing and they're the most crucial thing to look at. When I, the reason I talk about the Gospels is because you've really got uh, a lot of evidence that the Gospels reliably convey to us Jesus' life and words. And if you decide, this actually is a very similar uh, line of reasoning for me that I just gave you. Uh, if you decide that Jesus is who he said he is, then Jesus himself looks at the rest of the Bible with the greatest respect. Almost every book of the Bible, of the Older Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, is actually uh, quoted by Jesus authoritatively. So you can... If you say, I'm going to read the entire Bible and find anything that's incredible to me, and I'm going to decide whether I accept it or not that way. Again, you know, if Jesus is who he said he is, then you have to actually deal with the whole Bible because Jesus himself took it as authoritatively. If Jesus is not who he said he is, who cares about the rest of the Bible? Because that means the core of it isn't true. But in your book, you make great effort to argue around the life of Christ. Yeah. And you, great, you, you deal with the issue of the authenticity and trustworthiness of the Bible, which is a huge question for all of us. And what I'm asking you is, do you not find that what you say about those passages in the Bible may well be robust, but elsewhere the case is undermined, undermined rather badly? Well, maybe I didn't say this just right. Is Maybe I'm thick. Mm -hmm. Explain it in more simple terms. <laughs> Maybe you're just maybe you're just being a great interrogator. You, you, it's difficult. In fact, actually, nobody really knows how to get at the patriarchs. Whether what Abraham, whether Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did the things they did. What you have with Jesus and the Gospels is you. It's much more recent. You've got all kinds of evidence of it being of it being eyewitness, having eyewitness accounts, and so. The, fact, the way for me to trust what the Bible says about the patriarchs is did Jesus, does Jesus say, is Jesus who he says he is? If I decide he is, then I take what he says about the patriarchs seriously. And I can't, from my vantage point, do a very good job of saying, oh, there's miraculous elements in the Old Testament, therefore it's no good. Or so, murder. Well, I, actually, murder is done in the Old Testament, but it's not condoned in the Old Testament. Just because something is in a narrative, it's, it's a little easier to read the epistles. Where Paul says, I'm writing to you as a pastor, and you're the church, and I want you to do this, this, and this. Very simple. But for example, in the in the in Genesis, let me give you this example. In Genesis, you have all kinds of horrible things happening. Uh, you've got, uh, for example, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all have uh, more than one wife, polygamy. So many people read the book of Genesis and they say, This is ridiculous. Look at all these contradictions. Here in the Old Testament, it condones polygamy. Robert Alter, who's a great biblical scholar, Old Testament, a Hebrew uh, narrative scholar at uh, Berkeley, I believe. Robert Alter says anybody who reads the book of Genesis sees all the heroes having multiple wives and thinks, anybody who, who reads that and thinks that that's condoning polygamy has not learned how to read narrative. Every single person with multiple wives is having an absolutely miserable time. Just read it. <laughs> and he says, he says, I've got one wife. <laughs> He also says, if you also read it, you have Abel is the good guy rather than Cain, Isaac rather than Ishmael, Jacob ends up being chosen over Esau, and what you actually have is the law of primogeniture, which is the oldest son gets everything, and the law of polygamy, which is men can take all the wives they want. They're undermined by the book of Genesis, and so generally what people do is they read very, very superficially the Old Testament. They see all these horrible things happening, and say, this is a bunch of, this is a crock. And the answer is they haven't really learned how to read it. Okay, so. For more information about the Veritas book. Um, all right. That, was, um, that video came from a, a conference that happened at Columbia University, which is not a, um, it, it, not a Christian university. It's like a, it's like a major, uh, you know, in New York City, major university of, of the States. And they had this, uh, conference about belief and skepticism. And uh, one of the panelists was Tim Keller, 
Um, and uh, so it's not necessarily even like that everyone was listening to him believed. And he was trying to make the case for, here's why I believe the Bible. So I just want to hear from you guys. What are a couple of reasons he gave for, or what are a couple of the things that he, like a couple of the tips he gave about reading the Bible or why he believes it? Let's start with the Old Testament. He said, I believe the Old Testament is true, even though there's a, like a lot less, um, we have a lot less knowledge because it happened a lot longer ago. Here's why I think it's true. What did he say, Owen? Close, you're really close. Yeah, Be, not, not, he doesn't say Jesus wrote the Old Testament, although because Jesus is God, he inspired the Old Testament. But, um, but he says, because if you believe that Jesus is who he says he is in the, in the Gospels, in the New Testament, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it, Jesus says, I'm, I, am, I and the Father are one, I'm God. If you believe Jesus is God, he quotes the Old Testament as if it's true all the time. He, Jesus will say, it is written. And then he'll like quote something from Leviticus as if it's absolutely true. And then he'll quote a Psalm as if it's absolutely true. He'll quote Isaiah like it's absolutely true. And so he's like, Jesus clearly thought the Old Testament was true. And if he's God, then probably I can also trust that the Old Testament is true as well. If God thinks something is true, I think something is true too. That's what Tim Keller is saying. And Tim Keller is saying, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, then you've got a bigger problem than the Old Testament being false. It means that you think the whole Bible is false. But if you accept that in the Gospels, when Jesus says, I'm God, and you think that he is who he says he is, then you can confidently trust the Old Testament because Jesus did. That's what his point is. Now, he, there was another thing in there, though. The guy was like, well, what do you say to people who come up to you and is, are like, there is so much junk that happens in the Bible. Like Cain, <laughs> Cain right? Like chapter three of the Bible, Cain goes and kills his brother Abel. And, and uh, this other guy was saying, like, people say that to me all the time. Like, they come up to me and they're like, I can't believe the Bible because there's all this killing and guys having more than one wife. And there's one point in, in the book of uh, 2 Samuel where King David wants someone else's wife. So he kills the husband and takes the wife. And he's, like, supposed to be one of these, like, great heroes of the Bible, David, right? He wrote a whole bunch of the Psalms. And so people are like, I can't trust the Bible because look at all the... The bad stuff. Is it saying that's all okay? What did Tim Keller say to that, that thing? Someone besides Owen. What was he saying? Is the Bible saying that having more than one wife is okay? Why not? What was the reason Tim Keller gave? What? All of the characters in the Bible who had more than one wife, were they, was it, was it really good for them? Did they get a lot of benefits from that? He's like, yeah. He said, no. He said, actually, if you read the book of Genesis, it actually is giving you the message that that's not a good idea, having more than one wife. Um, like that was a cultural practice in the Middle East at that time. And he's saying, if you read the book of Genesis deeply and you like think about what's the theme of this book, you like, it's actually saying against polygamy it's like these guys were doing it and it was not going well for them he's like same thing with that murder with Cain and Abel Cain was murdering Abel but it's not the Bible isn't saying you should go murder your brother in a field it was show, it, you look at what happened to Cain so um the Bible sometimes shows how how broken humans are but it doesn't mean that the Bible is saying all that's true and, and good right um, so um, Tim Keller was like, you have to look at the story and see what happens to those characters who do those things. Um, so anyways, those were a couple of things that um, are important. By the way, what Tim Keller was saying there, this week, um, one of the online activities that everyone's going to do, uh, whether you're fully online or whether you guys are, um, activity 7.1, um, is you guys get to go to this uh, website called The Bible Project, and it has a page about all the different genres of writing that are in the Bible. There, and it has a little short video on, on like poetry and narrative and the epistles and the gospels. And you're just going to choose any one of them and you're going to watch it. And the video teaches you, how do you read that genre of literature? Because you're going to read a poem a lot differently than you would read a story, right? Poetry uses a lot of figurative language and um, a story... Uh, 
a, uh, a story will tell you something that a character does and then show you the consequences of that. Whereas like a, the, the gospel or an epistle, like he was saying, like when Paul writes a letter, like to the Corinthians, it's a lot more straightforward, like do this, do this, do this. So you have to read it differently depending on what kind of writing it is. So you guys are going to do that this week for activity 7.1. Um, anyways, I'm already talking too long on this point. Let's move on, you guys. So today, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present to you guys, or we're going to work together on, there's three different sort of major areas of evidence for the Bible being true. The first one is fulfilled prophecy. We'll look at that one first. The second one is archaeological evidence. We'll talk about what archaeological means, but I think you probably already know. Number three is historical evidence. So there's, there's evidence in all three of these areas that point to the Bible being a trustworthy book. We're going to look at all three, hopefully quickly. Okay, so let's start with fulfilled prophecy, number one. First of all, what does the word prophecy mean? Can you guys write this down in your notes? You guys have a little place where it says prophecy. And here's the definition of prophecy. Now, different people, and in your church, the way that your um, pastor, if you're part of a church, um, people use the word prophecy in different ways. So it, this might be slightly different from the way that it's used, but I'm giving you a very general definition. Prophecy means any message from God. Now, Last week, you guys, um, one, of the thing, one of your assignments on uh, the online assignments was for you guys to do a little bit of work with Scripture Typer. I don't know how many of you guys did that, but um, you were taking uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, and you were practicing it with that Bible memory website. But in that, um, in that verse, uh, Peter, who was one of Jesus' followers, he says to these early Christians, no prophecy of, of Scripture was ever just thought up by the prophet himself. It was the Holy Spirit within these godly men that gave them true messages from God. He's saying like, uh, everything in the Bible is basically a prophecy. It's all a message from God. Now, some Christians believe that God is still giving messages to us through prophecy. And so you may be part of a church where like in a worship service, somebody like says, I have a message that I feel like God's putting on my heart to share with a congregation, and some churches say that they would consider that prophecy as well. Uh, different Christians have different sort of practices around that and beliefs, but um, in general, uh, prophecy is a message from God. Often it's talking about something that's going to happen, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just about what's going on right now. Um, so the whole Bible is prophecy, basically. It's all a message from God, but in the, uh, in the Old Testament, there, were, there are these actual books of the Old Testament called prophets. They're the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then there are the minor prophets. There's a whole bunch of those. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, all the way down to Malachi. All those are, are the minor prophets. The reason they were called prophets, though, is that they, uh, they talked to the people of Israel about God's plan, about what was going to happen. And a lot of them were given bad news. He was like, you guys, if you don't listen to God, some bad stuff is going to happen. And then the Israelites didn't listen, and then bad stuff happened. The, the, the bad stuff that they said was going to happen, happened. But there are numerous prophecies recorded in the Old Testament that then come true in the New Testament. Um, and here's the thing. Some people will be like, yeah, okay, well, um, you know, I can make a prophecy. Like, Dario, you're going to have a, you're going to have some food sometime today, Right? And you can be like, anyone can make up a prophecy that's just sort of vague in general, and it will come true, right? But the thing about the prophecies in the Old Testament is that they are super specific. You guys know the horoscopes in the newspaper? You can like open up the newspaper and it'll be like, what, what month were you born? Are you a Capricorn or a Virgo or whatever? And then it will say like, this month, some new change is going to come to your life. Those, do they come true? Yes, because they're super general and vague. Everyone has change that comes into their life, right? Those prophecies are not really prophecies. They're just general statements. Dario, you shall have some food sometime today, right? Like, it's going to happen. 
So when Dario at lunch, when you're eating food, don't be like, wow, Mr. Nielsen must be a psychic, right? I'm not. But the thing is, the Old Testament prophecies aren't like that. They're super specific. In, there's a place in, in the book of Micah where it says this tiny little town in Israel, Bethlehem. It says that the Messiah is going to come from that town. But it's like really specific. He says the name of the town. And, uh, and then Jesus was born in that little town. And all the, all the scholars of the Old Testament before Jesus was born were like, what? How is this going to happen? And then it, and then it happened. So um, they were very specific. So we're going to do something right now. We're going to look at some of those prophecies. Um, we're going to, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, we're going to do it a little differently than I originally planned because there's fewer of us here. But what I'm going to do, you guys, is give you a little piece of paper that has a Bible verse on it. And I want you guys to grab your Bible at your table and look that verse up and read it. Okay? Um, so, yeah, get out your Bible or the one at your table. Okay. So, you guys, there's eight of us. And here's, here's how this is going to work. Um, four of us have Old Testament verses and four of us have New Testament verses. Um, the ones of us that have Old Testament verses... You guys have prophecies that were made. And the four of us that have a New Testament verse, we have a fulfillment of prophecy. And so what I want you guys to do is look up your verse and read it and think about like, I, if it's an Old Testament one, think about what is this saying is going to happen? And if it's a New Testament one, think about what happened. And then in about two minutes, we're going to stand up and walk around the room and try and find the partner the person who has the either the prophecy that fits with our fulfillment, or if you had an Old Testament one, the person whose New Testament passage fulfilled your prophecy, okay? So all of us have a pair. A New Testament one has an Old Testament pair. An Old Testament one has a New Testament pair. And we're going to see if we can pair up and find our partner who has the prophecy that matches our fulfillment. Just read it to yourself so you know, okay? I'm going to give you guys about one minute to just read it on your own. And then we'll stand up and move around and see if we can pair off with our, our partner or our pair. I would say read a couple times too if you if you found it. And if you have if you need a little hand finding it, let me know too. I'd love to help find it. Nice. Okay, you guys, let's try this. So you can take your Bible with you if you want to help you. But uh, you're going to stand up and try and just walk around and 
when you talk to someone, just explain sort of like what your verse was saying and try and consider like, do ours match up? Like, was mine talking about like the Savior will be born in Bethlehem? And mine says, oh, it was, he was born in Bethlehem. Oh, we're a pair. Or um, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And then, oh, a virgin had a son. Oh, we're the, we're the partner. Okay. So walk around, find people, talk with them and see if you can find your partner. Melt. your seats uh yours you and owen were paired together yeah okay so um anyways you guys there are so many of those that in the prophets uh foretold things that were going to happen in the old testament and then they came true in the new testament jesus himself if you just compare the life of jesus there are so many prophecies that he fulfills from the old testament and uh but uh, if you guys had just um, Micah 5.2, which I believe was Jeremiah, he had a, a verse that uh, was basically saying that this little tiny town called Bethlehem Ephrathah in Israel, it says, even though you're tiny, tiny town, the ruler, the Messiah is going to come from you. And then uh, was it you, Rocco, who had um, Luke 2.11? Okay. So then Rocco had the one that said when the... Uh, the angels announced today in Bethlehem, the town of David, a savior has been born to you. So um, those, those guys pa were paired up. Um, Isaiah 7, 14, I believe that, wait, yeah. Oh, and you had Isaiah 7, 14. What did yours say? While you're getting yours. Matthew, what, what, what did yours say? Because I know you were paired up with him. Mine said, should I read the whole thing? Sure, yeah. This is how the birth of Jesus came about his mother and her age. Thus, she gave him marriage to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be found to the Lord straight to her first age. Perfect. You can stop right there. Thanks. So, before... She was she was engaged, but before she and Joseph came together, uh, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And then yours, uh, what? Um, uh, Owen, sorry, go ahead. What did yours say? Okay. 
cool, awesome, yeah. So a virgin will, will conceive and um, then that happened. Cool. Um, oh, uh, Matthew 2, 13 through 15. I was, uh, Doc, wait, Dario, you had that one, right? And that's when the angel comes and tells Joseph, like, you got to get out of here because Herod's going to kill you. Go to Egypt. Um, and then yours, Valerie, said what again? When Israel was expelled, I left him and out of Egypt, I called my son. All right. And, and in the context of that chapter of Isaiah, he's talking about the Messiah who's going to be coming. And he said, out of Egypt, I called my son. And all the Bible scholars were like, wait a second. It says he's going to be from Bethlehem, but then it also says God's going to call him out of Egypt. So which one is it? But when you read the New Testament, you see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but then when he was just a baby, his family had to hightail it out of Israel, and they went to Egypt, and they lived there for two years. And then, they, and then because Herod was trying to kill him, and then they came back out of Egypt, back to Israel, when an angel said, it's time to go back. So both prophecies were, were fulfilled. And, and uh, Jewish experts in the Old Testament were like, wait a second, how is this going to work? There are two prophecies that are contradicting each other. But they didn't. Um, the last one was the one that Kiana and I had. What did you say, Kiana? Oh, was it like Zebulon or something? Yeah. And the land of Naphtali or something? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So again, that's Isaiah uh, or uh, yeah, it's Isaiah talking about the Messiah and what's, what he's going to do. And he's saying like the people who are living along the Sea of Galilee are going to be um, like the Messiah that is going to come and spend time doing his ministry there. And uh, just so you guys know, the Sea of Galilee is a long ways from Jerusalem. And uh, Jerusalem was like where it all happened. It was like New York City. Right. And people are like, oh, the Messiah is going to be out. And it's like, it would be like if Jesus came to the United States and went to North Dakota and was doing all his ministry there, right? And, uh, but in Matthew, it says, uh, my, my verse talked about how Jesus came and he went straight to, the, to Galilee, to the Sea of Galilee and did most of his ministry there. So fulfilling that prophecy. Anyways, um, these are just four that I, I pulled out. You guys, but there are so many fulfilled prophecies from the New Testament fulfilling the Old Testament. Um, even in surprising ways. You guys, you can just recycle this at the end of class or you can like tuck it in your folder if you want. But let's go on to, um, oh, uh, here's a couple others. Sorry, before, yeah, you can just put that in your folder or recycle it. But a couple of others, you guys don't have to write this down. But um, uh, in the gospels, here are some prophecies that were prophesied in the Bible that came true outside of the Bible, like in history. So Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, all three of those chapters, in those chapters, Jesus prophesies that the temple is going to be, the, the big main temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Okay, now Jesus was making those prophecies in around 30 AD. And all, and all of the um, Jewish leaders were very offended by that. They're like, how can he say the temple's going to be destroyed? Uh, who's going to destroy our temple? And like, they just... They, they did not believe him. It angered them that he was prophesying that. And then in 70 AD, Rome decided they were really tired of, of all of the uprisings in Israel because they were trying to like take over Israel. And they came in and they just demolished the whole city of Jerusalem, including the temple. And the, the Roman historian named Josephus recorded it. In his writings, we have that as a historical document that it happened. So it was prophesied in the Bible, and in a historical document, we see that it was fulfilled. Another one, this is an interesting one. Jeremiah, the prophet, predicts that the, the reinstatement of Israel as a nation in, in Jeremiah chapter 31. And after 70 AD, when Rome came in and just demolished Israel, the, there was no country of Israel. The people of Israel were spread all throughout the world. They were scattered. And for a long time, the country of Israel, the nation of Israel did not exist for 2,000 years, in fact, almost 2,000 years. And then, so Bible scholars looked at Jeremiah 31 and they said, look, it says in Jeremiah 31 that someday the nation of Israel will be re, like, brought together again and become a, a nation again. And everyone was like, that didn't happen. Look, there's no nation of Israel anymore. 
for hundreds of years until 1948. Do you guys, there's a big thing that happened in the 1940s, um, a terrible thing that happened in the world, in world history. Any guesses about what that was? It was a, it was a war. Yeah, it was a world war. You guys guess which one? It was two. Yeah, World War II. And along with that, this event called the Holocaust, where the, uh, the German, the Nazis were trying to completely get rid of the Jewish people. And they exterminated at least, I think it's six or eight million of them, right? Uh, after that, um, in 1948, the, the nations of the world got together in this new organization called the United Nations. And they were like, we've got to do something about this. And they, they made a new nation of Israel. And so in 1948, Israel became a country again. And now Israel is a country. Um, after almost 2,000 years of not existing. And people were like, oh, interesting. So, um, yeah, just another prophecy that came, came uh, was fulfilled. All right. So the second thing on your notes, you guys, and this is going to have to be the last thing that we do. We won't get to number three today. That's okay. But number two on your notes is archaeological evidence that the Bible is true. So you, yeah, you guys have on your note sheet there four things, right? But you see there are blanks in those four things. Now, uh, what I want you guys to do is pretend like you're archaeologists and you're going to dig up the answers to those blanks. So all around the room, taped up. And if you guys are online, it's just the last page of your document. But for you guys, all around the room, taped up on the side of the walls are the evidence with no blanks. And so you guys are trying to go around and find the answers to all the blanks. I'll give you guys about four minutes to try and do that. Get as many as you can. Okay? Yep. And so the numbers should match up with yours. Like this would be the first one um, that's on your notes. Or how? So, oh. By the way, if you, if you find one that you already saw again, there are two copies of each one. So don't, don't panic if you see a, a second one. You're like, wait, I already got that one. All right, you guys, take about one more minute if you haven't gotten them all. If you have gotten them, you can come on back to your seats, and then we'll run through them really quick.
There's only four, right? Yep. All right, you guys, so let's talk about them together here. Um, so, uh, first one, you guys, is talking about the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Um, it says, Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts, so two books that are in the New Testament, has been proven accurate by archaeology in regards to how many references to countries did you find, Matthew? Blank, the first blank there in number one. Uh, 32. 32 references to countries. Meaning like Luke in the book of Acts, he's like, yeah, we were sailing and we came to this uh, this uh, port on the Isle of, um, uh, what's the Isle called? Uh, Crete, on the island of Crete. And he like describes this town and this port and like they have historical evidence that's a real town, a real harbor, a real country. Cool. Um, how many cities, Kiana? 54 cities? 54 cities. And how many islands? Um, yeah, Bell? Nine. Nine islands, yeah. So in other words, like, there, they, there are no, like, made-up geographical places. They, they, can, they know that those exist. And if they don't exist anymore, like the name of a city has changed or something, they have an archaeological evidence that it did exist. Okay. That's 95 different references, all of which have been supported by archaeology. Number two, uh, I think I have a picture of this one. Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, John, who wrote the Gospel of John and also the letters 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and the book of Revelation. So he wrote five books of the New Testament. He was one of Jesus' disciples. But anyways, in his Gospel, the Gospel of John, he mentions that this place in Jerusalem called the Pool of Bethesda. And it was a place that people would come to like bathe, and they believed the waters would heal people. And um, in, in the gospel, he ta- he's like, in, in this po- around this pool of Bethesda, there were, um, what? What did he say, uh, Dario? We're on number two. Near the pool of Bethesda, there are five porches. Five porches. By a porch, he means like a, like a flat area where people could like sit and sit in the sun or whatever that were around the water, Okay. And for years, archaeologists, they believed that John was making that up or that he was wrong because they couldn't find any pool in Jerusalem that had five of these porches, platforms. No such place had ever been discovered. And then recently, and I don't have the exact year, but uh, 40 feet underground, uh, there was a pool that was discovered. And they were like digging it up. It turned out like another building had just been like a layer of the city had just been built right over top of it. But they like were digging under the, and they 40 feet underground, they found a pool and how many, what, what was around it? Uh, Jeremiah? What'd you say? Uh, at like the end of number two, those last two blanks there, what were discovered? Five porches, yeah. So, and they were like, oh, this is the pool of Bethesda John was talking about. It did exist. They just hadn't found it until just recently. Um, even though that was the bell, you guys, I will give you a five-minute break. We're going to just just finish number three and four. We'll have to talk about the last two on the back next week. But, um, okay, number three. Um, there are blank sites that show connections with the Old Testament that have been located in the lands of the Bible. Rocco? 25,000. Yeah. So again, like Tim Keller said, it's, it's a lot harder to find ex, like explicit specific stuff connected to the Old Testament. Um, but there still are like there are 25 archaeological sites that have, been, have found things that are connected in some way to, to the people or the stories of the Old Testament. Um, so like we have lots of evidence that all of like the things in the Bible in the Old Testament, um, like they're all accurate. Um, even if we don't have like a specific thing that has like Abraham's name on it specifically, we still know that like all the, the way just the way of life that it describes and everything are very, very accurate according to archaeology. Okay, number four. This is an interesting one too. The most ancient textual evidence we have, I have a picture of this one too. Um, we talked uh, two weeks ago about manuscripts, which are like pieces of papyrus that people wrote the original Um, Old Testament and New Testaments on. Anyways, we had um, the most ancient textual evidence that we have, the oldest chunk that has the actual original Bible on it is the Gospel of John. 
And it is dated just after what date, Owen? Say 180, did you say? Yeah, yeah 100 AD. Um, and so there's no other ancient document that we have, even secular documents. Like we were, I was talking to you guys just recently about Josephus, who was a Roman historian. And we have like all these uh, old manuscripts that have Josephus's writings on them. Um, even his, like which secular historians believe are very accurate. Um, no other ancient document, uh, even Josephus, where we have a copy made so blank to the original date of its writing. Close. Close. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that one we actually have to dig into a little bit more with the historical evidence. But um, even like secular non-Christian historians, one of the ways they measure how trustworthy a document is, is, okay, this isn't the original Gospel of John. Like it's a copy somebody made, but how close was it copied to when we know the original one was written and you want it to be really close. The further away it is, the more uh, possible it is that it's wrong. There's no ancient manuscript, Christian or secular, that is that close to the original date of writing as, as the Gospel of John, which is pretty amazing. Anyways, we're going to leave it there, you guys, and also online. We did not get number three historical support on the next page done yet. That's okay. Can I have you guys do this? I'm going to end the stream. Have a great day, you guys. And uh, everybody else, if you could...